Diane Dobson was born on the Saugeen First Nation Reserve near Southampton, Ontario, she was the third of ten children. All ten were taken away to be adopted, part of the 60s scoop, when Indigenous children were taken from their families and placed with white families. Diane was adopted by a family in Toronto when she was four and her last name was changed from her original Indigenous last name of Wabagona. She ran away when she was 13 and ended up in Windsor. She struggled with alcohol and drug addiction, worked as a cab driver and lived what police called a vulnerable lifestyle. She was working on turning her life around and was enrolled at St. Clair College to pursue nursing. Diane had began trying to reunite with her siblings. Her youngest sister Lara Fournier had been adopted by a family in Ohio, was also trying to find her family. The sisters found each other through the Saugeen First Nation and began talking by phone in the fall of 1994. Lara remembers her sister as kind, outgoing, positive and had a soft voice. They were supposed to be reunited in person one week after Diane's body was found. Diane was 36 years old, and a mother of three. She had a 17-year-old daughter and two sons, ages 11 and 13. Diane was found dead in Windsor, on February 15, 1995. She died from multiple hits to the head, likely from a steel bar before she was dumped in a ditch in Brighton Beach. She had last been seen at a Wendy's restaurant around the corner from her house and hitchhiking on Huron Church Road the day before she was killed. There was no evidence she had been restrained. Police previously said there were no defensive wounds, a sign she might not have seen it coming. The last time her daughter Rita heard her mother's voice was over the phone on Valentine's Day. Diane had called from her home in Windsor to say she was on her way to visit Rita and her brothers in Kingsville, about 45 minutes away. She never made it. At the time police said Diane's killing was an overkill, she more than likely died after the first hit but that didn't stop her killer from inflicting more blows. Police believe that it would have taken a strong person, likely a man to inflict such catastrophic injuries. The murder was so vicious that police believed the killer could kill again, and it's possible he did and it's also possible Diane wasn't his first victim. Diane's family last got an update from investigators in 2012, they were told there wasn't enough physical evidence to make any arrests. Investigators also never located the primary crime scene. In 1997, police thought they found it at a flop house on Ojibwe Parkway. They spent a week collecting evidence, but the large bloodstain investigators were focused on ended up being non-human. Another lead brought police to a bloodstain in the back of a cube van, but DNA testing showed the blood wasn't Diane's. Police interviewed more than 100 people, pursued potential witnesses and suspects, a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest was offered. Police searched hotels and motels, turning up nothing. Diane's ex-husband was cleared. The man she was living with was out of town when she was killed. One suspect died of a heroin overdose in 1996. Diane's family continues to wait for answers, it's been 28 years. One of the main strategies for solving cold cases is publicizing them, jogging people's memories and urging them to come forward. An estimated 95% of cases not solved immediately required the public's help, criminology professor and cold case expert Michael Arntfield of Western University said. This is the main reason why we post these videos. If you are not yet subscribed to the channel, please do so. Like and share the video and we'll see you in the next one.